I'd, good evening. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. The Minnesota Senate Health and Human Services Committee, we met earlier today for our regular meeting and recessed, and now we were coming back um, together for this important hearing tonight. And I really appreciate um, all of your attendance and especially um, all of the special guests we have here to present to, to us tonight. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I think it shows, um, you know, Minnesotans care a lot about, um, about access to health care, and, and we as a committee have goals to try and uh, find ways to better address, um, you know, access to health care and helping Minnesotans um, address their health care costs and, and how do we make health care more affordable. Um, I think that there... Um, we have spent time talking about uh, ways to do that in this committee, but we haven't had a chance to really talk about um, some of the issues that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, this transaction, the proposed transaction between Fairview and Sanford is a, a very significant one, and we should be um, asking questions and listening um, to all of the parties involved and to um, we have a responsibility to review and, and address these critical issues. Um, also, when you um, factor that the in that the University of Minnesota is such an important asset and um, a point of pride for our state, so we want to make sure that we understand how um, this transaction would affect uh, not only um, healthcare across Minnesota, but also how does it affect. Um, the interaction that um, exists between the, the University of Minnesota and Fairview. Um, so we have a, a short window of time here in the legislature to do our work, but we do want to make it a priority that we are investigating and asking questions about important issues and taking time to uh, bring forward legislation if we believe that there are ways that we should be acting as a legislature to address these, these questions. Uh, we have uh, bipartisan bills that we will be hearing um, next week to talk about uh, ways that the legislature can address um, different transaction review processes and um, how we might want to uh, state our preference in terms of how assets are, are handled. Um, and so I see this meeting tonight um, giving us as a committee to have uh, a chance to, to learn more about all the aspects of um, this uh, proposed merger and the effects on the university, and also for the public to have a chance to, to let us know what their concerns are. So we will uh, proceed through the agenda. We will have um, the ability to hear from the Attorney General first to hear an update on his uh, work to uh, investigate this transaction. Uh, we have the honor of having two of our former governors here tonight and um, look forward to hearing from Governor Dayton and Governor Pawlenty. Uh, we will hear from the uh, Fairview and Sanford CEOs. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, then we will also hear from the University of Minnesota. Um, after that, we will go to some other stakeholders who have um, let us know that they would really like to express their views on this transaction and its impact on Minnesota. And then we'll have a little time for um, members to discuss and ask questions and um, and then we will proceed that that will be concluding our, our our meeting tonight so again I really appreciate your your attendance and I'd like to move forward with um, Attorney General Keith Ellison and madam chair uh, Senator Abler uh, while he's coming up it sounds like you would rather we just listen quietly and, and then talk later uh, we can do questions I think after each you know each person or segment if you know, if you have a question um, to address to the Attorney General, I, I right. think we should do that as we go th go well, along Thank tonight. you very much. So, yep, you're welcome. I'll try to limit my questions because you know I have many, but thank you. You usually have many, yes. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Attorney General, welcome to the committee, and please uh, proceed with your, your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, and let me thank all members uh, for this very important hearing. Uh, this hearing uh, is uh, focusing on the subject matter which will have long-lasting and important effects on health care delivery in the state of Minnesota, in fact, uh, impacting literally thousands of employees uh, and uh, literally the way that we 
uh, move forward as a state and uh, look after the health of the people of the state. Um, the Minnesota Attorney General's Office uh, investigation is ongoing. Uh, ever since we learned of this matter, we started uh, collecting information from the state, uh, from the residents of the state, from people uh, who have an interest in this. We've had four community meetings. We've collected oh, nearly 5,000 separate messages online and uh, in uh, telephone, and we have uh, had an, our own independent uh, investigation that uh, is not public. Uh, but I can share a few details with you, including you know the following. Uh, though we cannot share with you all the details of our investigation because it's not public, we can tell you that the office has moved into a new phase of its investigation, demanding sworn statements from certain individuals pursuant to our investigative authority. Uh, our office is working tirelessly to ensure that Minnesotans' interests will be served. We've begun this new phase of our investigation uh, and we will continue to take statements and to receive information from people with relevant authority. Um, uh, the May 31st deadline, uh, which uh, is now uh, the one that uh, the parties have identified to close, uh, I will report to the committee, is not one that was negotiated with the Attorney General's office. Uh, we are glad that the date was moved somewhat, but we believe it's still inadequate uh, this deadline is a self-imposed deadline by Fairview and Sanford that puts significant unnecessary pressure on our office, this legislature, and the University of Minnesota to make the determinations under a timeline uh, that we have no control over. To be clear, the May 31st deadline that exists now for closing is not a negotiated deadline between the AGO, Fairview, and Sanford. Fairview and Sanford told us that they would close and when they would close and they did not ask us or consult with us before announcing the initial closing date or the revised date of May 31st, which frankly still does not give us adequate time. Our office is still demanding significant information from the parties that we should have received months ago. We're still uh, pursuing uh, this information, and but we believe that there have been uh, delays uh, that uh, did not need to happen. Um, here's also more what I can tell you. We know that Fairview is in a position it's in because of a series of business decisions that have left the organization in a really difficult financial position. Fairview has lost hundreds of millions of dollars in recent years. These are charitable assets uh, that are lost. Char uh, Fairview's struggles are no secret. In January, Fairview's rating agencies downgraded Fairview's credit rating and issued negative outlooks for the organization worsening Fairview's already unstable financial situation. This is, of course, un a concern for us, and we are monitoring it closely. Um, further, though it would be premature to discuss our findings uh, as yet, uh, we do continue to assess whether this transaction violates charities and antitrust laws. Uh, we continue to assess various theories, including uh, diversion of charitable assets, from the uses and purposes for which those assets were received and held. Uh, we continue to look at breach of fiduciary duties and uh, breach of trust. Uh, whether the merger would substantially lessen competition, unreasonably restrain trade, or result in monopolization of certain healthcare <clears throat> services, these are matters which we uh, consider to be critical to get to the bottom of, and the current time frame I believe uh, restricts us unnecessarily. At this point, we have not ruled out any specific claims or theories under antitrust laws or charities laws. But while there's no conclusions that we have reached, we are very concerned. Information we've discovered has, uh, uh, brought, has heightened this concern. Uh, and it is possible, however, that our office may find no violations of law. I, 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 I'm not saying that that is the case, but it is possible. But still, we could come to the conclusion that the merger is not in the best interest of the public. The legislature could consider bills that would give us additional tools related to our ability to investigate large healthcare transactions and consolidations, including consideration of whether a given transaction serves the public interest. This is a piece of uh, 
possible legislation that I hope you will consider. Uh, we would support the effort if you did. We are diligently investigating all aspects, aspects of the proposed merger, including how it would affect the management and operations of facilities jointly operated by Fairview and the university pursuant to their contractual agreements. In order to preserve the integrity of our investigation, we are unable to comment on any proposals by the university, Fairview, or Sanford regarding future operations. The public should know that, as I have said from the very beginning, we continue to look at this from the perspective of whether or not it is good for Minnesota. Like we, had, like we have said, it is more important for us to get this right than to do it quickly. We expect Sanford and Fairview to provide us uh, with the time we need and cooperate fully with our investigation, including the sworn statements and outstanding written discovery that we have been seeking. Uh, with that, I'll conclude my comments, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ellison. Members, have any questions? Um, Senator, Senator Abler. Well, you're looking at me, Madam yeah. Chair. Um, no, I just want to thank, I think that's a very thorough, solid array of questions to ask, and I agree that uh, it's good to take our time and get this right. I have some very real concerns myself, but I, I just appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'll save most of the questions that I accumulated here for at the end when we've had a chance to hear everybody. But there was a couple things that just happened to pop out um, that you commented on and get a little clarity. You talked about all the messages you received online. Is that a special um, email box or anything they send to you? And the reason I ask is in fact, I was just contacted today about your office, and they said they can't email you. It's got to be by USPS. So I'm wondering about that comment. No, uh, the data that we get in this matter is investigative data, and therefore, under the Data Practices Act, it's not, it's not public data. But if anyone wants to contact us, we're not at liberty to tell the rest of the public what people have asked us about. It's between our office and the person who made the request. And that's so that people can feel free to make inquiries of the Attorney General's office. As you might guess, people, they ask us about being defrauded or something like that. They may not want the rest of the public to know. So the D Data Practices Act has protected that data as non-public data. But uh, yeah, we receive information through email all the time. We receive it. You can file a complaint online with us, and we've received a lot of information that way. And of course, uh, you can always call us. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, um, one one additional thing, and then we'll we'll wait till the end. But uh, uh, you commented on demanding sworn statements, and I thought that was a fairly aggressive statement. Um, you asked for statements, and you didn't receive them. Or why are we demanding them? I mean, what's the give and take here? Attorney General Ellison. Madam Chair. Senator, in the course of, we're, we're a law firm. The Attorney General's office is common for us to conduct discovery by doing what we call document demands. That's what, that's the legal term of art for them. Uh, and uh, so it's just uh, the normal discovery process that happens every single day in every law firm in America, including the Attorney General's office. Senator Adkey. Thank you, and that's it. I just wanted to make sure you were getting what you were asking for, and it wasn't that you were having to go extra steps. So thank you. Uh, Attorney General. Madam General. Chair, I, I do want to be clear. Uh, there is information that we've asked for that we believe we should have received already. Uh, my lawyers are working with uh, the other parties, and we're, ex we're hopeful and expectant that it will, we will receive the information that we're looking for. But, uh, uh, but I want to be clear. There's things we've asked for we haven't received yet. Members, any other questions? Um, Attorney Gen General, I was just going to ask, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I just wondered, you know, we have kind of a, um, the legislature works under a kind of a confined timeline. We meet until, you know, the May 22nd or whatever, and we adjourn, and, um, and then we're not able to take action. Is there anything you can tell us about? Are there any other points that you've can foresee that we would be able to um, have access to any other additional information or comments from your office or um, just any feedback on that? 
Madam Chair, my office stands at the ready to work with the legislature at your pleasure. Okay. We'll talk to any member individually or any committee or the whole legislature at once. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that uh, the tools that we have to investigate potential violations of charity law or antitrust law, uh, I think, and this is my personal opinion, are not necessarily adequate to protect the best interests of the public all the time because it could be that uh, these, that, and, and I'm not saying that it will be, I'm saying that it could be, that uh, there is a merger or consolidation uh, that may not violate the technical aspects of an existing point of law, but still, uh, we know overall it's not in the best interest of the people of the state. Um, I think it's worthwhile for the legislature to explore the possibility of more tools. Uh, as you may know, um, you know, antitrust law uh, and charities law uh, has not been updated in decades, and uh, maybe it's due for some reconsideration. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we, you know, we are proceeding with some of that work to investigate what we can propose as, as bills and have discussion amongst um, committee members to see if there is something that, that we could move forward this session. But thank you Madam very Chair, much. Um, Senator Abler. Just real short, I'm trying to be short. Uh, do you have any idea, Madam Chair, uh, Attorney General Ellison, do you have an idea about how soon you'll be developing your opinion about so many of the questions you raised? Attorney Ma General? Madam Allison. Chair, this is a, a good question, and, and I want to just assure you, Senator, that we, that I'm, I'm telling my staff to move with all deliberate speed, and, but at the same time, you know, uh, we're beginning a process of, of, of deposition and document discovery, as I noted uh, uh, for Senator uh, uh, Utney, that, that there's, we're still trying to get the information we've asked for. We expect that we'll be getting it uh, in due time. Uh, if we don't get it, there there are legal tools for us to to get it, you know, uh, and but we hope that through a process of disc of negotiation and cooperation, we will be able to get the information that we're looking for. I wish I could give you a a, a firm timeline. Unfortunately, Senator, I can't do that because it just all kind of depends upon when we get the stuff and then digest the stuff, because we can get a bunch of stuff and then you still got to figure out what it all means. Uh, so I would I would say that we're moving as quickly as we can, uh, and I think a better outcome would be for us to get together with the parties and negotiate when a closing date would 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 be appropriate if it, if one ever should be appropriate. But at this point, um, you know, we've just been told, well, we have a closing date in March. Now we have a closing date in May. We we were not consulted. We wish we were, uh, but uh, that's the current state of affairs. Senator Atkey, do you have another question? Yeah. Um, the, when you were talking about these demands for sworn statements, when were those sent out? Um, you know, Attorney General? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would have to ask my staff to give me the exact date. I can tell you that there. Um, can I get back to the, uh, with that, Senator? I'm, I've assigned a team to work on this. They, they could give you exact date. And uh, I don't know if anybody's... Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get back with you, Senator. That would be helpful if you can uh, provide the information to the committee. That would be helpful. Thank Certainly, you. Madam Chair. I'm glad that Senator Utney asked that. I think it would be, uh, I think it's helpful information mm -hmm. for the committee to have, yes. quite frankly. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, any other questions, members? Well, thank you very much for your time and um, appreciate that your, um, your office is available for us for, for other questions. and. Um, look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks, from Senator. Always at your service. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd I'd like to move on to um, invite Governor Governor Dayton, if you would come forward to provide your te your uh, testimony tonight. Good evening. It's very nice to see you, and thank you, thank you for you. thank you for coming. And uh, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Utke, members of the committee, I thank you for this opportunity to offer my perspective on the potential merger of Minnesota-based Fairview Health with South Dakota-based Sanford Health, and on the proposals the University of Minnesota's Medical School is making in this legislative session. 
I'm delighted to appear tonight with Governor Pawlenty. This is the first time he and I have spoken together publicly, which underscores the great importance we attach to these critical matters. I also want to pay tribute to Attorney General Ellison, whose direct involvement has been so important to preventing a disaster from occurring. The prospect that governance of the University of Minnesota's academic health center could shift to a South Dakota-based enterprise is alarming and should never be allowed to happen. Hopefully the statements by the principals yesterday constitute firm commitments to transfer the university's medical assets back from Fairview. If not, a proposed merger between Fairview and Sanford should be prohibited. As a land-grant <clears throat> institution, the University of Minnesota and all of its assets are obligated, both legally and morally, to be used for the benefit of our state and our citizens. They should be solely governed, directed, and funded by its Board of Regents and this legislature. To allow any other arrangement would be a terrible betrayal of the trust bestowed by the people of Minnesota. I am a walking poster board for the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> I've had major medical procedures at Mayo, Alina, Regions, Tria, the Ely Hospital, and the University of Minnesota. <laughs> My father survived a heart attack thanks to a swift response by the Cook Hospital, followed by a Duluth medical helicopter transporting him to a Minneapolis hospital. He lived for another 20 years. Quality medical care throughout our state is the number one benefit we get from living in Minnesota. Yet when I, as governor, proposed funding increases and a new building for the University of Minnesota's medical center, I discovered that many legislators were surprisingly unaware or unconvinced of the medical school's paramount importance to our state. Just look at the benefits it and our state's other health care providers provide. Their doctors, nurses, and other per medical personnel work and live in communities large and small throughout Minnesota and add immeasurably to their social fabric. The institutions who employ them boost those local economies with their payroll dollars and other expenditures. And how can you measure the relief to a spouse or parent whose loved one has a medical emergency and can receive top quality care just moments later? Additionally, this medical expertise drives innovations, inventions, and services that have spawned hundreds of healthcare businesses in Minnesota, which have in turn brought thousands of other highly qualified women and men into our state. Principal contributors to these enormous benefits are the University of Minnesota's medical and nursing schools and other health programs, which each year attract best quality students who graduate as well-trained professionals, most of whom remain in Minnesota, and provide top-level health care services to all the rest of us. Each year, the university graduates 80% of the new doctors in Minnesota, and 70% of the physicians practicing in Minnesota today trained at the U. The return on those investments is enormous. So the actions you are being asked to approve in this session while very significant, are commensurate with their importance to our state's future. First and foremost, all of the university's medical units must be returned to the ownership and control of the regents, the legislature, and the people of Minnesota. The transfer of facilities to the Fairview system in the 1990s was a grievous mistake, which must be and can be rectified. Then, from the state's large budget surplus, Providing the funding needed to upgrade facilities and improve medical training is essential to maintaining the school's premier status and attracting the best and brightest future doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel. So that when we take ourselves or our loved ones in for life-saving medical treatments, we can be assured that we will be in the hands of the very best professionals anywhere in the country. Every other state wants the premier medical services that we enjoy. The challenges of remaining the very best are significant. Far more severe, however, would be the terrible consequences 
of failing to make the investments and take the other actions essential to surpassing our competitors. That is why the Mayo Clinic 11 years ago <clears throat> asked the legislature to partner with them in establishing Rochester as the destination medical center, which passed with bipartisan support. Mayo recognized that it was in stiff competition with facilities in other states and countries for medical supremacy. The university faces a similar challenge now to either move ahead and remain among the very best medical schools in the country or fall behind into stagnation and mediocrity. By its proposals, the U has made it clear which direction it wants to go, but it needs your help to get there. I'm also going to make a suggestion that might not be entirely welcomed by the university. In my experience, the medical school has sometimes suffered from the appropriate lack of, lack of appropriate priority by the administration and regents. I had to push my funding increases for the medical school through the resistance of the former president who had other higher funding priorities. Same with the new building, which I had to force through the administration and the legislature. At this critical and precarious juncture, I recommend that your legislation supporting these budget requests also establish an ongoing advisory council for the medical school. It should be a small working group consisting of key legislators, independent medical leaders, and if I could be so bold, Governor Plenty and myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for work these days. So. <laughs> this group could both advise Dr. Tolar and Mr. Franz, who are excellent leaders for this undertaking, and also serve as advocates for its future initiatives. In closing, I cannot overemphasize the paramount importance of the University of Minnesota's medical school to our entire state. I'll say it again, quality medical care everywhere throughout Minnesota is the number one benefit we can offer our citizens. So please help take good care of this priceless treasure. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, your testimony and your members. Any any questions for the governor, Senator Abler? And so uh, good to see you again, Governor. Yeah, you too. I enjoyed our time together. And yes. actually, I uh, appreciate your sage advice. I think it's uh, well advised, and um, I like the direction you're going in. I, I, the advisory committee, and maybe we can find some work for you and the other governor. Mm -hmm. um, but I. Uh, <laughs> But you're, you're, uh, you've been around a while and in many different levels, and I think your thoughts are, are very important and very well considered, and I am so happy to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know how you rate, but you get, you know, three governors to show up to this committee in, in a period of a month and a half is, is beyond. But um, Governor Dayton, you have been a health advocate your entire life, and my family owes you a huge debt. <laughs> and to, um, to hear your words uh, is all I need, and I appreciate you being here and your service on behalf of people in Minnesota. Well, thank you, it's Senator. truly hope, treasured, and I mean that. I hope thank Hope you. is doing very well. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you again, thank you. and your, your ideas are very intriguing and appreciated. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Governor Pawlenty to come forward. And welcome, welcome to the committee, and thank you for for coming tonight. Thank you, Chair Wickland, and to Representative Republican Lee Utke, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I also just want to take a quick minute and thank you for your public service. Uh, having served in the Minnesota legislature for a decade, I have some understanding and appreciation for what your service means to you, to your families, uh, to your other life obligations, and I just want to say thank you for doing it. It's sometimes a um, unforgiving and always not appreciated position, but I appreciate what you do. And so thank you for serving, each and every one of you. Um, I also want to thank Governor Dayton for his uh, partnership on this topic. 
He and I have wildly different political backgrounds, uh, but we've always gotten along personally. I enjoy visiting with him, and I'm particularly pleased to appear with him tonight on behalf of this important uh, issue and cause that we're speaking about this evening. Um, I told a friend recently that I was going to be here tonight to talk about this issue involving the Sanford uh, Fairview merger uh, and what that means for the university. And, and this friend said, what, what difference does it make? And I was puzzled by that. I was taken aback by it. And I thought, my goodness, uh, it makes a huge difference. And I had a conversation with him and shared some of my thoughts. And by the end, he absolutely agreed, strongly agreed. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of issue that may not always be front and center on the minds of voters, but I think if you had a chance to explain to them what it really means to them, their families, their health care, and our broader health care delivery platform and ecosystem in Minnesota, they would understand and appreciate the role of the university even more than they already do. As Governor Dayton noted, Minnesota punches above its weight for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is that Minnesota is a national and global center for health care excellence and innovation, and also the quality of care that is distributed and available across our great state. Our health care system and the quality of health care in the state of Minnesota is undeniably one of the most important strategic assets that we have, and it helps Minnesotans greatly. And Minnesota's strategic advantage in that regard doesn't exist. It does not exist without the historic and current role of the University of Minnesota's academic health centers, more broadly known as the University of Minnesota Medical Center platform. As Governor Dayton noted, just as an example, nearly all the doctors in the state, 80%, uh, or I should say the medical graduates that graduate each year, 80% of them come out of the University of Minnesota. Uh, the University of Minnesota is the only public uh, medical school in the state of Minnesota. As noted, 70% of all the doctors, if they didn't get their original training or their residency or fellow or some follow-on training, 70% of the doctors in Minnesota get some of their training, if not all of it, from the University of Minnesota. The, the U also uh, re, uh, educates and trains a, a good portion of the rest of the healthcare workforce in the state of Minnesota. The U is one of the largest producers of medical research and public health research, not only in the nation, but in the world. And the, the University of Minnesota Medical Center has been a huge and a mission critical talent magnet for people to come to Minnesota, stay in Minnesota, and be part of our incredible healthcare system and our broader state and our broader economy and serving our state in very, very important ways. The list goes on and on, but of course the university has played a historic and continuing role in life-changing innovations, medical devices, biomedical technology, new procedures, public health improvements, cancer and disease research, and it goes on and on. And it, it is amazing that the role that this uh, university, our university, has played. The bottom line is this. When it comes to our health care in Minnesota, we all bleed red but we have all benefited mightily from the, the maroon and gold. And that is the University of Minnesota Medical Center and the role that they play in this system. So how does all this relate to the merger that's before you uh, this evening conceptually and maybe before you in the coming weeks relative to a particular piece of legislation? Time doesn't allow a long explanation, but in my view of watching this over a long period of time, what happened in short, oversimplified, is this. Academic health centers and academic hospitals have a teaching and research cost overburden. Uh, at a time when, in, particularly in the late 80s and 90s, third party payers, including the government, had a reimbursement rates that did not recognize and still don't recognize that teaching and research overburden. And so it became very difficult for academic health centers to compete with those kinds of reimbursement rates and those kinds of margins. And of course, they became into financial challenge. And so the university and other academic health centers around the country sold their assets, transferred their assets in, in a technical sense because it's between nonprofits, and they got some benefit from that. But now we come to the point where academic health centers are trying, not just in Minnesota, but in other places too, reacquiring those assets for a variety of reasons. And this merger is triggering that need or that discussion in Minnesota now. So. What we have before us is a merger proposal that has a lot of different dynamics to it, challenges and opportunities, but the main thing for policymakers, this committee and your colleagues in the legislature, is protecting and advancing Minnesota's interests. And that interest, you know, when you think about what 
M Health is, that big sign out front, that big maroon M on the front door of all these buildings all across Minnesota, it's there for a reason. Uh, it's because it's a very valuable brand that people know and respect and understand and appreciate what's underneath that in terms of the history contributions and what that reflects for the state of Minnesota. It says M Health. It doesn't say, you know, out of state health. It says Minnesota, it stands for Minnesota Health. And as far as I know, there is no precedent. There is no precedent for an out-of-state entity owning or controlling a state's flagship uh, a, a medical uh, academic hospital uh, or academic medical center. I, I know of no precedent for that. If this were to go forward and, and the merger were to take place, you'd have potentially that situation at an unprecedented taking uh, in Minnesota. Uh, I, I hope you find that to be very concerning and very uh, noteworthy. Uh, I will also tell you that Sanford and Fairview have recognized this. They've sent a letter uh, to the university and they've said, look, we, we kind of get it. Uh, if you want these assets back, buy them back. So if that's the spirit of the discussion, then it really becomes just a valuation exercise. And that's a more complicated topic, and there's a lot underneath the hood, and you'll hear a little bit about that tonight, and you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. So if we're at the point where uh, that's what's going to happen, it, the legislature can play a very key role in brokering, facilitating, and, and maybe helping negotiate, but funding if need be, uh, such a series of transactions. So I just want to let you know that this is a top issue for Minnesota for a whole variety of reasons. It's absolutely critical, absolutely critical that this uh, gets addressed in a timely manner. And I hope that each and every one of you will, will take a leadership role in making sure that the outcome is constructive and positive uh, for the state of Minnesota. Sky Yuma, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Senator, Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, Thank you, Governor Pawlenty. Uh, question for you, because you just touched on it right at the end. Uh, there was a letter shared, and there was also an article in the Star Tribune um, about a possible sale and an agreement and such. Would everything you just said previously totally change if that was the case, and uh, there was a sale and an agreement reached, and it stayed uh, as you ex explained it? Governor Pawlenty. Uh, Chair Wickland, uh, Senator Utke. Well, it, it, again, the, you'll hear momentarily from the university and, and from Sanford and from Fairview, but if the assets indeed were transferred back to university control and that could, an agreement regarding that could be reached for a reasonable and workable price, uh, that piece of it, yes, would be addressed and solved. But it also then opens up the question and the opportunity, and it can be exciting, is what happens next? And so if you're an academic health center with cost overburdens for teaching and research, you need uh, money and you need uh, clinical partners beyond just the geographic footprint of the university's campus that are going to work with you and ultimately help send you patients and pay their bills. And so that might be Fairview and Sanford, might be others or some combination. And I think that prospect while noteworthy, could be very exciting. And I'll just say, healthcare obviously is changing rapidly. Technology is changing. Uh, the financial burdens of healthcare in our current legacy platforms may be unsustainable, and there's going to have to be change. And who better in Minnesota, besides our wonderful policymakers, than the University of Minnesota uh, to help lead that vision for a better, brighter, more efficient, more accessible, a higher quality healthcare system. And I think, you know, if you give the U the tools, namely the facilities and the funding, and invite them in to lead that future vision, I think they'll do a good job. Senator Oki. Thank you. Um, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks, uh, Governor. It's good to see you again as well. I've enjoyed working with you. and. And I, it's just there's a ghost of Governor Carlson hanging over your head uh, who would have given a similar That's speech. scary. <laughs> I mean, he's still alive, eh? but I just, but, um, but I, I, I think that the collective wisdom the three of you have brought, uh, when you add uh, Attorney General Ellison, you even make a more wildly diverse uh, group of political figures. But I think the, it's, there's wisdom in what you have to say. And um, I, I see it as an exciting time. And I, I take great encouragement from your comments as well. 
Madam, Madam uh, Chair Wickland and yes. Senator Abler, thank you for your nice comments. And all kidding aside, I think I don't want to speak for Governor Carlson, but if I were here, I suspect he'd have a, a strong university bias as well. Well, thank you again. I really, really appreciate your taking time to, to provide your thoughts, and um, we really value your, your input and appreciate your, your presence tonight. Pleasure to be here. I am a pl proud alumni, alum of the University of Minnesota. I was there seven years. I did get two degrees in seven years, so I wasn't just, you know, <laughs> goofing off the whole time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, next we'll move, um, move forward to hearing from um, James Hereford from Fairview Health Services. And, and Mr. Gasson, if you wish to, yeah, you can both um, join us at the table and um, welcome. Welcome to our committee room, and um, please go ahead and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for having us today. We appreciate the opportunity to share how combined Sanford Health and Fairview Health Services will benefit Minnesotans and patients who choose to receive their care. My name is James Hereford. I'm a president and CEO of Fairview Health Services. Since we announced our intent to combine last November, I've talked with thousands of staff, patients, and community partners. I'm humbled by the stories they share with me of their work, of their health journeys, and the impact we're making together. These stories fill me with pride, but they also make me more confident than ever that combining with Sanford Health is the right thing to do for Minnesotans. At the end of the day, our obligation is to make sure that we are there for our patients, our communities, and our people. As has been alluded to, the status quo is not an option. The new realities we face in healthcare delivery are too pressing, and I stress delivery. There are many parts of the healthcare ecosystem that are doing quite well. Healthcare delivery is not. The need to provide the best care for our patients is simply too great. We must advance through innovation and involve health systems in a way that protects our viability and ability to deliver the highest quality care to our patients in our hospitals, our clinics, and our communities. The past few years have tested our nation's healthcare delivery systems and our caregivers like never before. Over half the care delivery systems in this country lost money last year. And 2023 doesn't signal a change. Our caregivers were heroes in the face of a deadly pandemic. While many in our society have moved on, the impact on caregivers and care delivery systems remains. Clinical burnout, labor shortages are at historic levels, and patient violence is on the rise. It has been, never been more difficult to be a care provider in the United States. The reality is there's no going back. We can't go back to the way it was. We must go forward. We need to be proactive and pragmatic. This merger is a forward-looking step to strengthen our organizations and protect our shared mission as we navigate a rapidly evolving healthcare ecosystem. Before proceeding, I'd like to take a moment to address Fairview's relationship with the University of Minnesota. We are proud of the partnership we've had with the University of Minnesota since 1997. In that time, we have delivered unrivaled care for patients in our communities. While we have a partnership with the university, we are not a university health system. In addition to the hospital and ambulatory care sites that are on or adjacent to the university campus, we also operate 10 hospitals and ambulatory centers and more than 40 primary and specialty care clinics across the Twin Cities and northeastern Minnesota. We employ more than 28,000 people and hold partnerships with nearly 2,000 independent physicians. Since we purchased the East Bank facility, in 1997, Fairview has invested nearly $1 billion of capital in our facilities on the university campus, in addition to hundreds of millions of academic support to the university of of university's research mission. We have been very dedicated to the support of the University of Minnesota. As we shared, we support the university's long-term strategic impact vision announced in January. Fairview and the future combined system are indeed willing to sell these assets to the university to support its mission of research, education, and public health. Given the university's desired date of March 1st, 2024, to, be, to begin operating these hospitals, 
it's imperative to begin the process of negotiating the value of these assets and starting the transition as soon as possible. In embarking upon this work, our focus remains and must remain on ensuring the stability for our staff and continuity of care for our patients who entrust us with their care every day. Importantly, I'd also like to thank Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison and his team for their very full and thorough review of our proposed merger. To date, Fairview and Sanford Health have provided tens of thousands of pages of documents at the Attorney General's request, and we stand ready to continue to support his request, his office request. We've also voluntarily extended our planning timeline to allow the Attorney General's office more time for their work. We did so with a profound respect for the Attorney General's robust review process and authority over these matters. Another vitally important part of this process has been community meetings hosted by the Attorney General across the state as a forum for discussion, questions, and feedback. Bill, my partner here, and I traveled to attend each of the four meetings across our state, and we're pleased that the majority of community members who shared comments during these meetings supported our plans. Why? Because our organizations have proven our commitment to high quality care and to investing in the communities in which we're a part. We also heard important questions, which we valued and have appreciated the opportunity to address. For example, we reiterated our commitment to maintaining access to essential care, like full spectrum of women's reproductive health care, including abortion and gender affirming care in Minnesota. We committed that this merger is not one of reduction. Between the two of us, we have 9,000 job openings. The state of Minnesota has the lowest unemployment rate or one of the lowest in the country. This is not about contraction. This is about expansion. It's about expanding services and doing more for those who come to us for care. It's about bringing advanced care to more underserved communities. And it's about increasing our investment to strengthen and evolve care delivery in Minnesota. We've reiterated these commitments and others, both in writing and during community meetings across the state. Finally, I want to address those who have alluded to Sanford as an outsider, a foreign entity from the Dakotas unfit to participate in Minnesota's healthcare ecosystem. The reality is that for more than 25 years, Sanford has served Minnesotans with more than 7,000 dedicated employees across 20 hospitals and 70 clinics in communities like Bemidji, Thief River Falls, Worthington, and Laverne. Their dedication to communities and patients underscores why Sanford is the right partner for Fairview and for the state of Minnesota. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Herford. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Herford, for, um, for testifying, and, and I appreciate your, your comments. I just said there's, um, there's something that's always been kind of um, bothering me. You know, hearsay is a lot of say, right? Um, but, but is it true that you didn't tell some of your own board members, there are three members from the University of Minnesota, um, about the merger until you sign the letter of intent? Is that a true statement? That's that is a there? false statement. Uh, Mr. Right. Herbert. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, sorry. Senator. 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 Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. That was a false statement. I, right. uh, we informed our university colleagues, two of which are Fairview board members, in uh, August 7th, I believe, prior to the Fairview board meeting in which I informed the full board of the potential of a merger. The letter of intent was signed much later. Senator Hoffman. So, Madam Chair, I just want to point out, I don't appreciate the defensiveness that the, that the person gave in, in your committee, but I will tell you this, that the, the letter of intent wasn't brought to the board meeting until August, so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that, and I do not appreciate being jumped over by a testifier, and I'm not going to debate with a testifier. My questions are concerning the work we do and our governance in this committee, and I just wanted to make sure that you know that I'm not going to be disrespectful to anybody on this, so just to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Senator Abler? I want to thank you for coming, and I'm interested to hear from your, uh, your compatriot there as well. And, and uh, I have, it's no surprise, I have some very real concerns, and I'm trying to be open-minded, and I appreciate hearing what you have to say. Um, I understand the, at least the side part of health economics not being running a hospital and a teaching institution, but I have been watching this for two decades. Um, and so um, I think it's an important time. I think th this could go really well and be amazing, or it could go 
not good and not be good at all for the people in Minnesota. And so I remain open to be persuaded. On the uh, transfer of assets, um, I, I, I think as you engage in these negotiations, the term fair market value is the wrong term to use. Maybe a break even on the assets invested would make more sense. I think the people that I represent would be willing to think about that number. I don't know if that's the number that you has come up with. They kind of picked a number. I think you start talking about 300 million and a billion, it gets people's attention. Now we're really talking. Uh, it probably isn't zero, and it probably isn't whatever you could rebuild them for. So um, I, I think I, I speak on behalf of all the colleagues I've talked to. We're interested to be a part of the solution to serve the people in both of your uh, spheres of care needs. Uh, the innovations that might happen, but to be sure that whatever benefits happen do pass down and trickle down to the, to the, the patients being served and not just accrue to some corporate thing somewhere and uh, nonprofit or otherwise. But um, I truly appreciate you being here. Thank you, Thank Madam you. Chair. If I could, Mr. Quickly. Hereford, yes. First, I would like to apologize. My comments were not meant to be disrespectful. Um, I am battling a little bit of a cold, but this is too important to not be here. So again, I do apologize. Uh, Madam Chair, also relative to the Senator's comments, we agree. And it's always a matter of negotiating a value. Um, and we stand ready to uh, initiate that process uh, as quickly as we can. Any other questions right now? Um, Otherwise, uh, Mr. Gasson, if you'd like to make your remarks. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senators. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our vision tonight and how uh, this will benefit the patients in the communities that we have the privilege of serving. My name is Bill Gasson. I'm the president and the CEO for Sanford Health. As CEO, I am committed to leading Sanford Health with one fundamental principle in mind, and that is at the end of every decision we make is a patient. Sanford Health is dedicated to transforming healthcare experience and providing access to world-class care here in America's heartland. Our integrated health system is nationally recognized for quality and provides expert care in more than 80 specialties. It includes a health plan, a senior care division, a medical research enterprise, and graduate medical education that trains hundreds of residents and fellows each year. Many of them choose to stay in practice in rural clinics and hospitals in communities that we serve, like Perham, Jackson, and Bagley, ensuring Minnesotans have access to care close to home. Our long history in Minnesota underscores our steadfast commitment to doing what is best for the communities that we have the privilege of serving here in Minnesota. And when we say that our patients will have access to better care, we mean it. Following our merger, with North Country Health Services in Bemidji, Sanford Health invested more than $100 million to increase access to specialty care, including mental health, cardiology, orthopedics, and oncology. And after merging with Merit Care in 2009, we invested more than a billion dollars of capital in the northwest part of the state, bringing level one trauma to the Fargo-Moorhead communities and a state-of-the-art hospital in Three River Falls. As a follow-up to our House legislative testimony, we shared the letter of intent to combine Sanford Health and Fairview Health Services. In keeping with our track record in other communities, that letter of intent includes an initial strategic capital investment of $500 million from Sanford Health into the hospitals and the facilities in Minnesota communities that are currently served by Fairview. This significant re uh, investment reflects our fundamental commitment to expanding services and increasing access to world-class care here in Minnesota. We understand that this, that this merger is important to Minnesotans as is represented this evening. And we've been committed to engaging with our stakeholders. Throughout the Attorney General's process, we've done that. And I would like to take a few minutes to provide assurances and address some of the issues that have been raised through that process. First, as has been discussed this evening, nothing would change for the University of Minnesota as a result of this merger. We will honor the existing agreements with the university, which will be governed by a local Minnesota-based board until the sale of their desired assets is completed. 
as James mentioned and as we've communicated to the university and as Governor Valenti mentioned this evening, we support the impact health care vision and their five-point plan that they articulated publicly on January 6th. We are ready to work with the university on the valuation and the purchase of those assets. We have stated that we would also like to maintain a clinical partnership between our combined system, the University of Minnesota, its medical school, and UMP. We look forward to continuing discussions about what that optimal partnership looks like. Second, the proposed combination will not result in fewer options for gender-affirming care and comprehensive women health, women's health care, including abortion services. Third, we have no plans to close Minnesota facilities or reduce access to care as a result of this merger. Fourth, Sanford Health has, had long, has long had unionized workforces in the state of Minnesota, and we will continue to honor and respect our collective bargaining agreements post-merger. Fifth, and contrary to what some have suggested, and I appreciate tonight has been corrected here, Sanford Health, like Fairview Health Services, is a 501c3 community-based not-for-profit. We are not a for-profit organization. We do not have shareholders. The sole purpose for our organization existing is to take care of our patients and to serve our communities. And finally, the combined system will not divert or transfer from Minnesota any assets donated to Minnesota, and, the, and the, those donations will be used exclusively for the charitable purposes for which they have been designated. And in closing, I too would like to take the opportunity to thank the Attorney General and his team for their very thorough review and their process which is ongoing. We continue to work closely with him and his office to ensure that they receive the information necessary to complete the review. As James stated, this merger is about doing more for those who we serve. And every day that we delay is a missed opportunity to realize significant benefits for our patients, our people, and the communities that we serve. This is also about taking critical steps to provide the necessary financial sustainability to serve Minnesota communities for generations to come. Sanford Health is very proud of our 25-year track record of providing high-quality care here in the state of Minnesota. This merger is about increasing access, it's about improving quality, and it's about expanding services. Our combined system will be better for our patients, our caregivers, employees, and our communities. And I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to share that vision with you here this evening. Uh, look forward to your questions. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gosson. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Atkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Gasson. Um, Sanford's got a huge footprint up in my part of the state, um, as you mentioned, from Bemidji to Thief River to uh, Detroit Lakes and Fargo-Moorhead area, um, and then every small town in between, including I live in Park Rapids, and you've got a clinic there. So um, you've invested heavily in our part of the state, and you, as you explained, the rest of the, the state that you cover also. So... We thank you for that. Um, it, it allows us to have um, a number of good, exceptional health care providers, and uh, it's a lot of times when you live in the rural areas, you don't have that. And we're lucky enough and fortunate enough to have. So I thank you for that. But a question that I have for either one of you or both of you, because you would have been on the receiving end, um, I questioned and asked or asked questions when we started this of uh, the Attorney General, these uh, uh, the demand for the sworn statements. Uh, when did you receive those, if you know? Mr. Gasson? Madam Chair, Senator, thank you for your statements, and it is a pride to be able to serve those communities here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, relative to your specific question, uh, I believe, uh, although not specifically uh, stated by Attorney General Ellison, he was referring to uh, the subpoenas for the depositions to be taken of members. We received those today at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Senator Atke. Thank you. Because um, that's what I was looking for, is, uh, just to follow up. So I appreciate that. And again, thank you to both of you uh, for what you're doing. And I look forward to uh, watching this move forward. Thank you. Senator Abler. 
Well, thank you. Is it Mr. Gasson, not, you know, not Dr. Yeah. Welcome to the committee. And we've not had the privilege of chatting, but we will, I'm sure. Um, and that's actually a very pressure-laden chair to sit in, to sit in front of us, in front of an audience, and with two uh, very successful governors of our great state and um, uh, behind you and very interested people. So I appreciate you sitting there and I appreciate your statements. And I appreciate you saying all those things in public. And so whatever direction this goes and should it move forward, then uh, a lot of us will hold you accountable for those statements. Um, and I think, I'm not interested in looking back at all. I, I think looking back, this could have been done a little differently and maybe there'd be a little different process, but that's pointless to discuss that. I'm interested in looking forward. Um, and uh, I think as you continue to amend your statement, Mr. Gasson, I think you'll... Uh, kind of take the, put the you in the rearview mirror of what your acquisition may include, uh, as Governor Plenty so well said and cautioned by Governor Dayton that this really belongs to the state. And it's, it's, I don't think it's any offense to a company based out of Minnesota, but it's just so important to us. And that may have been something you didn't quite realize in the beginning of this, but I think um, separating that out will give much more clarity into what it is you're trying to do, and people may appreciate the benefits. I'm learning from listening to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will encourage you, as well as I did to uh, Mr. Herfer, that um, it's not for sale on a real estate auction block for the, yeah. the regular price. This is a Minnesota asset uh, for which Fairview and others have derived some benefit and given money back, and I don't even know what the net thing is. But um, the quickest that can be put beside us in, uh, behind us the better and now at a time like this where there's some actually some money in the bank is a good time to look after that and madam chair this is just a phenomenal hearing and i appreciate these good people coming and uh, the way the conversation is going thank you thank you senator morrison thank you madam chair um, and i do want to thank our two former governors for being here tonight i think we were all um we, I think we all saw that they're both their political skills and their Minnesota and Gopher pride on full display. It's quite obvious how they got to the position that they were. Thank you both for being here and for sharing your, the long view and expertise that you've developed over the years. Um, and I want to thank you, too, for, for being here to take all of these questions and sit on the hot seat. Um, I appreciated, Mr. Herford, your explicitly bringing up abortion care and gender-affirming care. Um, I'm an OBGYN when I'm not a legislator, and um, you've probably heard of the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe versus Wade, and that is um, creating an unfolding public health crisis across our country. Um, and so I'm sure you can understand that given the restrictive healthcare laws uh, that exist all around Minnesota, that people um, who take care of women and people who can become pregnant are very concerned about, about that. And I'm wondering how Sanford has managed that in being based in a state that has had historically pretty restrictive reproductive health care laws. Um, has there been political advocacy among leadership at Sanford? How, how do you manage that? Uh, Mr. Gasson. Madam Chair, Senator, thank you for your question uh, and the opportunity uh, to be able to be here this evening. Uh, as Mr. Hereford stated, uh, and I also reiterated uh, as well in my statements, uh, mm -hmm. similar commitments that we've made to the university, commitments we've made to the Attorney General's office and publicly, that as a result of the merger, there will not be a change to that care that's delivered today. The way in which we're able to assure that is by being express, being very deliberate as we put together the new organization, leaving that decision making here locally at the medical centers where those decisions are made, letting that be governed and led by the uh, med staff who makes those decisions today and will continue to do that, and have that maintained expressly by the bylaws that govern the organization at a local Minnesota-based level. Uh, as you reference, uh, today we have a privilege of serving a multitude of different jurisdictions. Uh, we're domiciled actually in the state of North Dakota. Uh, we do have a headquarters office in South Dakota, uh, but both of those states have different laws as well as the state of Minnesota and the state of Iowa as well. And uh, first and foremost, like all health systems, comply with federal law, whatever it may be in those state laws, but then where and when we can, uh, as we've talked about in this situation, to leave that decision-making process 
to our providers, who are the individuals who are positioned to do that. Today at Sanford Health, we do not have a corporate policy that governs the way in which abortion care services are provided or any other care, uh, nor will we in the future. That's not the way that good health care is delivered, and that's not the way that health care decisions need to be made in the future or today. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a couple questions about, um, you spoke about the, the potential for um, uh, in, in, an investment that you'd make, um, I think you said like 100 million or 500 million, whatever, um, in, in facilities in the state. And I wondered if you could talk about how, how do you go about deci making decisions about what type of invest investments to make? And I guess my concern is that, you know, we, um, in the legislature, we're trying to find ways to help um, keep costs from rising for Minnesotans. And while investments in uh, facilities, you know, it might be um, might be great, it also might be a way that prices just are, are increasing for consumers and, and maybe the value um, to people overall isn't necessarily there. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> I just wondered if you could comment on your process for, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for deciding how to make those investments. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate the question, uh, and it's uh, somewhat coincides as well too with uh, Senator Adler your comments and statements earlier about those facilities. And uh, while facilities can be a very important aspect of how we deliver care, uh, that's not certainly the only consideration. It's also not the only way that we expand access, that we improve the quality of care that we receive and that we expand services. And so using as an example uh, the academic assets that the university has talked about and desires to, uh, to acquire, those are not assets that either of us would look at and say, goodness, we hope to get rid of those assets because, gosh, we just, you know, we don't need them. Uh, but instead, uh, we think that those are important assets. We think that those are important facilities to being able to deliver care uh, into the future. That all being stated, it's in the spirit of partnership and the desire to be seen as a partner and to be a true partner to the state of Minnesota that we would step aside and say that let's create that opportunity for them to acquire those facilities. And so now, thinking about that in uh, sort of a, a post-close merger world, where now Sanford and Fairview have come together, but we have uh, worked together with the state of Minnesota and allowed them to purchase those assets, uh, and now to have those be uh, governed and run by the state of Minnesota. Uh, what we would do at that point in time, which is the way that we've always engaged every community, is that, as we know here, and as we've heard tonight, healthcare is local. Uh, and the way in which it's best to determine how to invest those dollars is to engage that local board. Uh, and so the way in which uh, the system would be designed, there'd be a Minnesota-based board uh, that would be local, that would be represented, uh, uh, be made of a representation of those here in Minnesota that would help work together with the teams who are leading in those facilities, who are leading the delivery of care, to determine what are the most important priorities. What is it that they need the most right now in the greater Twin Cities area and the Fairview footprint to be able to expand access, to be able to improve quality and to add new services and to do it in a sustainable way going forward. And so when we do this, we don't have a predetermined uh, decision about where those dollars will go, but instead it's more of a process where you engage locally to find out what are the needs and how do we best address those so that we can get the most mileage out of those dollars and the commitment that we've made. And I want to stress it's just an initial commitment of uh, $500 million of net new sort of on top of routine capital because we believe that that's important. We believe that the need is there to be able to make those investments. But going forward, that's how those investments will be determined uh, as we continue to grow together. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, and then I guess just one last uh, comment, and a, if you want to respond to, I, I think that you know part of my concern about the transaction, the merger transaction, is that um, I've seen in, in just doing research and reading about um, consolidation in the healthcare industry um, in the United States, that s people who have studied um, transactions feel that um, it's apparent that uh, once consolidation happens, that it can lead to increased prices, which can be because um, you know 
having a greater market share, being able to influence insurers and in, in determining networks, and all of that is um, maybe not conducive to helping um, our concerns about trying to keep prices from rising as quickly. Um, the United States, we spend a great deal on health care, and, and seeing that we ha see in increases in health care prices, um, you know, we'd like to see that kept to a minimum. So um, I guess from your perspective, um, if you can tell me how you look at it when you're looking at consolidation and uh, benefits to Minnesotans, you know, all across from um, finding services they need available where they live, which um, that I've heard, you know, there can be changes. And then it, just the prices that they're having to pay for those services. Um, how does this consolidation, how does this merger, um, how do you see it playing out and affecting Minnesotans? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as it relates to that, I'm uh, also very familiar with certain of those studies as well as the counter studies uh, that demonstrate that that's not always the case. Uh, and it's important when you look at those studies uh, that have been published that would suggest that you have that uh, effect that you've described there. Uh, and the factual patterns that are at play in those situations are not uh, in, in play in this situation. And so what you'll find there is you'll find competitors who are in the same MSA or the same geographic market where they're providing those services. Uh, and as a result, you have them coming together and at times being able to leverage that in a way that you described there. Uh, as it relates to Sanford and Fairview Health Services, that is not the case. Uh, we do not have overlapping geographies. We do not overlap one another in those services that we provide. And so you don't have that market density uh, that's articulated and described in those uh, situations. And what I would uh, point to, which is most specifically, is uh, look at what we've done, hold us accountable to what we've done as we've grown together. And I think there's probably no finer examples of that and then the opportunity that we had through the Attorney General's process to be able to go into the communities where Sanford Health has had the privilege to grow together with other healthcare delivery uh, systems like uh, we're talking about here, where we've been able to do that in Bemidji, we've done that in Worthington. And what has actually been the effect there is that which I've described and which James and I uh, have talked about, and it's increasing access. It's increasing the quality of care that's provided. It's increasing this, uh, those services in the you know, community of Bemidji as an example. Uh, it's not only just keeping the hospital open, but it's the fact that we've, in the last decade, increased the number of providers by more than 50%. It's the fact that we have come together and made the necessary investments to add things like the state's first pediatric empath program to provide mental health crisis care to children. It's about coming into those communities like Worthington where we brought advanced oncology care so that the individual, the patient who testified in the public listening session, who's a single parent who doesn't have the ability to find care for her children, to travel an hour and a half away to care, that can't afford to take time off from work, is able to stay home and to receive those services. And those services don't pay for themselves on their own. Uh, but as a part of a whole system that believes in the mission of not-for-profit health care, we make investments in those communities that do just that. Uh, and that's what, uh, as being said, we should be held accountable for what we talk about here. I would expect that this committee and everybody, more importantly, who you represent, would hold us accountable to doing that same thing as Sanford Health and Fairview Health Services have the opportunity to come together and do the same things that we've done before. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your response. Um, yeah, and thank you both for being willing to come here tonight and speak to us. I don't know if members have any other. No. Oh, Senator Hoffman, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. G Gasson. Is that it? Did I say that right? Yes, sir. I um, appreciate you talking about um, what you guys bring to the table, and, and I appreciate you not being in a, in a matter that um, was defensive. And so <laughs> I do, and speaking of consolidation, I, I think it's one of the things that's topic of mind in Minnesota. Uh, for the first time in history, we have 1.3 million people, 65 and older, and that's more than the K-12 education system. Um, you know, Good Samaritan, which was part of that, that larger Good Samaritan system that you guys uh, purchased uh, 2019, I believe it was, Mr. Gasson, and, and that was 200 long-term care facilities. There's skilled nursing plus some other things, right? And, and one of the things we know we can predict in Minnesota is the 
um, the silver tsunami and, and what is our response or, or what aren't we doing to respond it, right? And, and we can start looking at some trends you start to see. Hospitals are saying 17 to 20 percent of the population is there because there isn't any long-term um, uh, care for folks afterwards, mm -hmm. right? And, and it, it kind of puzzles me as they look at when you made the merger with Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. and now I know, you, you know, looking at the merger with, with uh, Fairview, you know, you have Ebenezer, they do assisted living, they got some independent living, they have these different programs that are all independent living ki kinds of stuff that are associated with the, with the University of Minnesota. What's your vision? Um, when you're looking at the silver tsunami, and, you know, at 200 Good, good Samaritan homes, and now you've seven states, you've, you've done, done a statement about yep. merging to the Midwest now as of March, 15 more states are now falling offline, and I'm thinking, okay, those were sales. You probably sold those, but still there's a, there's a concern when you look at Minnesota and the landscape and you say, okay, here we are, and, and you have Good Samaritans all, all around the Twin Cities metro area. So I guess the, the question to you is somebody that, that looks at long-term care and looks at, you know, what are we doing in Minnesota because it's a, it's a big deal, right? Uh, what, what's your vision? As, you know, as you're coming into a system, um, knowing that, you know, you consolidated, you moved some things around, you did it. Kind of talk about what your vision is and, and why you did what you did on that aspect. I would appreciate that. So, thank you. Mr. Gasson. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, thanks so much for the question. And uh, I appreciate your interest and in, uh, apparent, obviously, knowledge uh, as it relates to some of the challenges that, that industry faces, but how critically important it is. Uh, and as you uh, correctly articulated in 2019, the Good Samaritan Society, also a not-for-profit, uh, merged together with Sanford Health. Uh, and then it was at that point in time uh, that it was already a stressed and a very challenged industry then, unfortunately, because of many of the things that we know relative to reimbursement, the labor challenges that existed even before the pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic, unfortunately, wreaked uh, horrific havoc uh, on the long-term care industry and those who provide that essential care coming out into the last, you know, 2022, you see that all those financial headwinds continued to hit. Uh, but for us uh, at Sanford Health and working with the Good Samaritan Society and our parent board uh, have committed to doubling down, uh, that rather sort of running out of, uh, we're going to continue to run into those senior services for the reasons that you've stated, uh, that especially for us in many of the communities that we're at, whether you're a large, a medium, or a small community, uh, if we're not providing those services, oftentimes nobody else is. Uh, because of those challenges. And so as we've looked at how do we do this uh, and how do we do it in an effective and a sustainable way that first and foremost has to be uh, ensuring that we have safe, appropriate care for our residents and that we create an environment where our employees uh, feel safe and stable as well. What we've looked at, and as you articulated there, is understanding where do we do the best job of that. Uh, and where we're able to do that is where we have a larger contingency of our resources, if you will. And so it's finding states where we have both the acute side, our hospitals and our clinics, as well as where we have the post-acute side, where we really do a, a, a much better job, not a perfect job. We've got a lot of work to still go, uh, but where we're able to manage that whole continuum of care. And so whether it's finding uh, appropriate care where people don't need to be inside a hospital anymore and we can get them to that transitional care, but then it's also making sure that we have good communication and we can start sharing with resources as well and providing support for our uh, individuals who are delivering that care, our caregivers within those facilities. And so as we've done that, our commitment is really, uh, and as you articulated there, a seven state area. Uh, that if you think about sort of the core area where our acute care footprint is in South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, and then hitting some of the surrounding areas of continuing to invest in post-acute Nebraska and Kansas, and looking at those areas to say as we found good partners, uh, to take over those facilities that where we might have only had one or two sniffs in a particular state, somebody else has a larger contingency of that and they can do a better job of helping from a staffing perspective and helping on those resources. And with those dollars, we're taking those uh, as a not-for-profit and reinvesting them back into these communities. So uh, on our reinvestment plan, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota are top three on that list for reimbursement. Uh, and it's looking at ways to continue to build out those models. Uh, and oftentimes we find when you have sort of those transitional uh, facilities, if you will, where it's independent living, uh, but it's adjacent to assisted living, and then all the way into that skilled nursing, uh, where it allows individuals to continue to sort of age at home, closer to home, and be able to be able to continue to provide those services, as well as continuing to build out on the virtual side to do what we can uh, to extend care at home. 
uh, for home health uh, where and when that makes sense, uh, but knowing that we have to have these facilities available. And so we believe, at least at Sanford Health, that that's an important part of the future, uh, especially as not-for-profit healthcare industry, that it's important to not only be really good on the acute side, but you have to be able to uh, be committed and have the right investments on the post-acute side of the house. So you'll see us continue to make uh, really significant investments in the post-acute side as well. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, no, I appreciate Mr. Gasson's uh, response. I just wanted to, as we look at, you know, we have 53,000 job vacancies in long-term care, and we have just this, the silver tsunami is here, and we, we got to, you know, we are now uh, reactive to that. And so it was just I wanted to hear what his vision was on that, and just as we are looking at our policies going forward. So thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you both for, for coming tonight, and I, I think we'll, you know, it, this is, uh, provokes more questions. We'll we'll let you know if we have more questions for you about um, the transaction. And now, um, with the new uh, proposals from the university, it might bring more questions to us. So, thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senators. <laughs> And now I'd, I'd like to move to a presentation by the University of Minnesota, um, Mr. Myron Franz and Dr. Jacob Tolar. Please join us at the table. Welcome and um, welcome to our committee room. And um, I guess whoever would like to go first, Mr. Franz or Mr. Tolar. Madam Chair. Uh, senators, uh, everyone, uh, thank you for having us and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak in front of you on this critical issue for the state of Minnesota. My name is Jacob Tolar. I'm a bone marrow transplant physician and uh, I serve as the dean of the medical school at the University of Minnesota. Been at this school for 30 years now and uh, I have a deep appreciation for this. It is with that sentiment that I am profoundly grateful to Governor Dayton and Governor Polenti for their comments because I'm at all, I'm at all that it is even possible to build healthcare in a way that it has been done in Minnesota. I am at all that uh, the governors realize that this is the number one asset of the state. I'm at all and tremendous recognition that this is considered and recognized as a strategic asset and a talent magnet. That's exactly what we are beneficiaries of. Them. And the University of Minnesota has been incredibly grateful for your leadership and your predecessors. We started in 1888, the first hospital in 1911. It's been a while. And we have benefited from the actions of these governors, the medical discovery teams, the Health Science Education Center, and so forth, to build that talent magnet that we are talking about. So that's why we are here. We are here to talk about how is this partnership that we have with the state, the mission-driven care that we deliver through the clinical care and the science that informs the clinical care, as well as the training that puts people that will come after us and carry that legacy, that, that legacy of 135 years forward. So the, the question really is what the Attorney General asked, is this good for Minnesota? And uh, I will present you know, both you know, why we at the university oppose this letter of intent and this acquisition at this format at this time, but also how it creates an opportunity for something much better and much bigger, and we will call it UMN Health for the moment. So the reasons why university opposes the merger between Fairview and Sanford House, as we understand it, there are several, but the most relevant ones are being that the healthcare facilities of our campus, the, the, the brain of our practice, the, the place where our learners learn, and you have heard the numbers, I will not repeat them. We are very proud of them, by the way, uh, will be governed by an organization in South Dakota. And regardless of the good intentions of Mr. Gasson, there is a risk that South Dakota laws having impact on women's health care, reproductive care, and it's difficult to see how this campus, our work, our layered work that we stood on the shoulders of people who preceded us, the people who have, who have worked very hard to make this a preeminent medical center and preeminent state in the union to deliver health care, how this work can possibly be a priority. 
And that's clear by the letter in, of intent which was developed without the university. The letter indicates that the merger is intended to move forward without university, with or without university. It includes no indication of a structure that supports academic medicine after 2026 when the contract would run out. So if a merger is allowed as early as of May of this year, it's important to note that regardless of the statements about the governance of Minnesota assets by the regional Minnesota board, the ultimate authority rests with the parent South Dakota board. <coughs> Fairview and Sanford march to acquisition presented, in my opinion, an opportunity. An opportunity to think better and bigger, and that's where we need your help. That's why on January 12th, the president, senior vice president, France and myself presented our five-point vision to transform healthcare in Minnesota through academic medicine and uh, anchored this in our proven ability to improve access to high quality, innovative, and equitable care in the state of Minnesota. There are two facts that are important to note. The first, the university has been planning for an improved clinical campus for many years, systematically buying the land that we will need to eventually build a new hospital and to create an ecosystem of healthcare and innovation, partnering with industry, healthcare systems, and communities. Second, we are proud of the work that we have done with Fairview in creating the joint clinical enterprise we called M Health Fairview. We have increased quality. We have implemented a structure including physician leadership. This is the best model in healthcare in the United States, physician leadership. We have created new models of care and treatments and created new ways of access to Minnesotans. We value the colleagues we have who work very hard every day on behalf of these patients of ours. And all of that we are proposing was meant to build on that success. Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, Madam Mr. Chair, Fence. thank you and members of the, of the committee, Governor Dayton, Governor Pawlenty, Attorney General Ellison and his talented team, President Gable and the University of Minnesota Board of Regents for their support. And thank you to all those patients and families who selected the Block M for their health care. I'd like to take a moment to uh, explain from my view how uh, dramatic this particular point is in time and how we have to get it right. Uh, I think one of the things that Governor Pawlenty described very well was this, the nature of the healthcare industry in the 80s and 90s and what led to the ultimate decision by the University of Minnesota <clears throat> to allow for the transfer of the East Bank or the uh, Un Un University of Minnesota Medical Center to the Fairview system. That <clears throat> process was troubling at the time and as a my good friend Governor Dayton mentioned that was a mistake. And uh, one thing I know about Governor Dayton, he's never, he never holds back his opinions of things. So <laughs> I've learned that well. Uh, but when you take a look at that transaction, it's important to remember what happened at that point. That was the creation of an academic health system. And when that was created, it, it bestowed those assets the buildings and the operations and the people that make up that system, it bestowed them with this public mission. The people of Minnesota supported the, the development of those assets. They supported the building of those hospitals. Both Fairview supported those uh, uh, hospitals and that system, and so did the University of Minnesota. But so did the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. So the creation of that academic health center in 1997, when, when, when Fairview changed its mission to uh, agree with the idea of an academic health system supporting education and research and clinical care, that changed the nature of those assets that were used in a combined form beginning in 1997 and continues until today. So that is what was created. And then now we're at a point where we have to decide the future of those assets. Now, I also want to re recall that in the last several years, and well, let me go back to 2018. As uh, Dean Toller, who was there and can talk about, we developed a, an agreement, a joint clinical enterprise, to work together to further enhance the academic health system that was started in 1997. And that has been 
very successful in delivering patient care, innovative care to people around this state and through the M Health Fairview system. But one of the things that I want to talk about is that as Fairview began uh, not performing financially very well, to say the least, and started losing hundreds of millions of dollars, that's about the time that I uh, became a board member. I don't think that's a cause. I, I hope it's not a cause, but that's, <laughs> that's the time that I joined the University of Minnesota and became a designated a member of the Fairview Board, along with Dean Toller and another, uh, Dr. Geller. And it was through that process of learning about the great aspects of the M Health Fairview clinical enterprise that was working and getting better and better under the direction of Dr. Bev and you at University of Minnesota Physicians and working really well in, in developing the great care. As we started learning about the losses that kept mounting, we became more and more concerned. And if you know anything about me, you know I don't like the idea of losing money or having a deficit. And so as we, as we started learning about those issues, uh, Dean Toller and I repeatedly uh, offered our assistance and were interested in trying to figure out ways to help improve the financial bottom line. And that really became uh, apparent in the spring of 2022. It was during the spring of 2022, and maybe in June of 2022, that it became clear that the financial situation was worsening uh, in 2022 than originally thought. And uh, Dean Toller and I and other of our colleagues in our conversations with Fairview continued to uh, offer assistance and help in trying to figure out ways to, uh, to make this turn around. I'm saying this because I think it's important to understand that uh, we could be in a different position today, but we're not, because during that same time, Fairview and Sanford began their discussions about this proposed merger, which makes total sense. They have both had good business reasons to do so. There's no denying that. But the problem is they were dealing with the combined, uh, the system and their agreement with the University of Minnesota and those clinical assets. Uh, that was a public decision. And that must, should have been a public discussion about how to change the nature of the relationship. Changing it's fine. The agreements can be changed. Different systems can be developed and designed. Uh, they're never perfect, and we can always make those changes. But the fact of the matter was we were not advised of nor participated in the development of the letter of intent between Fairview and Sanford. And uh, both as a board member, I found that inappropriate, but also as a, a member of the University of Minnesota and its relationship in this joint clinical enterprise partnership. And so... Uh, once that happened, we, uh, we, Dean Toller and I, voted no at the board meeting. I think it was proposed at, the, at a September board meeting and because we didn't have a copy of it before. We didn't understand it. And I now know more now about my objection uh, was developing at that time, but I now know that it's certainly in my belief the transfer of those assets to another entity without the engagement and approval of the university and those public assets is a problem. And I suggest it's a serious problem for the Attorney General. So as we go through that process and where we are today, we are working to, to undo what was done in, in 1997 in the sense of re-establishing the university as owner, operator, governor, governing those assets going forward. Now, we've heard the idea about valuation, but remember, the public, in order to, to protect the public's interest in the, the public's very public mission interest in these assets, you have to look at the nature of what they were intended to be used for beginning in January 1, 1997 until today. And that, that, that mission hasn't changed. It's the same mission. And there's been, there have been donors, there's been a lot of people contributing to those assets and to that academic health practice. And that kind of gets to this whole idea that when, when we're talking about a five-point plan, you know, the first part of that five-point plan is that we have a world-class academic health system. And thank God we have Dr. Taylor, uh, Dean Taylor at the, at the helm of that, and we've just increased our ranking dramatically in this last several weeks. But we also talk about, number two, is university governance and control of our flagship facilities. 
Number three is developing opportunities for strategic partnerships. Number four is a new state-of-the-art hospital. Number five is an investment in our current facilities. Well, number two and three have to go together. When you talk about governing the flagship assets and an opportunity for strategic partnership, we're not proposing that these buildings be sold on an auction block to us or anyone else that happens to walk by. What we're saying is they need to be transferred to the University of Minnesota as part of a negotiated strategic partnership because a university cannot survive on those four uh, uh, facilities on their own. We need to have a community hospital system where we have patients, referrals, where we have an opportunity for our doctors to practice and our nurses to, to support them. So uh, the idea that we can do this without combining two and three and then we can just stop off on this merger train, stop off for a while, negotiate the sale of these buildings, and then go down the merger train is simply not accurate. It doesn't deal with the academic health system that's been created for the benefit for the people of Minnesota. So it's our position that uh, this merger should not take place unless and until there is an agreement with the University of Minnesota about both the acquisition or reacquisition of the assets and about a strategic partnership going forward. And that's all I have, Dean Toller. you have anything else? That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Um, Chair Wicom. Dr. Toller. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll add to this, uh, just to repeat what uh, Senior Vice President said, you know, in a moment is you cannot have one or the other. You know, this, uh, what, what really matters in the building, such as a hospital, is really not the bricks and mortar. It really matters the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, the teams that are inside. That is the business. That is the franchise. And that is what we are talking about. And when we are looking at uh, at uh, healthcare systems in Minnesota, we truly are in a very unique, good position because healthcare in Minnesota is excellent. That's why I came here 30 years ago from across the Atlantic. And uh, we are not saying that only faculty can deliver good healthcare. That's not true at all. We work and partner with multiple healthcare systems in, in urban setting, in rural setting, and, and to Senator Hoffman's comment on the silver tsunami, that is the answer. The academic medicine is a good business and it is an answer because it will develop the way that it, that it, that it, that it, that it should. And uh, I would like you to humbly present you with the fact that this is a moment rich in peril. A lot is in stake. The ability of your university and its medical school and its clinical arm, which is the, and physicians, which is the backbone for the interaction with med tech in the state. It's a backbone for economy. It's a backbone for training. It's a backbone for access, equitable access, is at stake the ability to develop value-based care, to really go to the underserved areas of the state, or the cities for that matter, and the uh, ability to design with your help better payment models for the business of healthcare. That again rests with the academic mission of the medical school and this university. So we will continue to focus with you on mental health, on women's, health, on addiction, on infectious disease. This was the list of targets that you have given us some years ago. And yes, we have delivered. And we are in a position that the investments that you have made in us, in the cancer clinical trials, in the rural outreach, and in medical discovery teams that I have mentioned, we have returned that investment back to the patients, to Minnesotans. So I am grateful for your partnership, for your leadership, uh, for your openness of mind, and for the sheer magnanimity of considering this as a public question rather than narrow business deal, which it is not. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for, your, for both of your comments. Um, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, my friend Franz, it is always wonderful to see you in front of a committee. and. Um, Never, never question your ability to, to balance somebody's checkbook, right? Whether it had been the state for many years. I'm glad you laughed because my wife is watching and she said, <laughs> that is not funny, John. Uh, don't try to be funny with Myron. But, but, but you bring up a couple of points I think that are worthy of discussion, Madam Chair, especially in our, our committee. 
And, and I don't know the nuances of it, but it's my understanding we have one license, three of the buildings, one license, right? And, and then I also know that I think we own, we, meaning, you know, the, the university owns two, the land of two of those, plus the surgical center, and I think the ambulatory center as well, right? And then what you do is you lease space back to the other organization. Uh, Fairview at this point. Um, I, I guess what, what comes up is, to me, it's like, to your point, my, Mr. Franz, when you were talking about, you know, there's got to be some kind of... Um, sign up, write up something on that piece of it, right? But, but what, what, what really gets me is, is two things. And the first one I'll get to you is that you indicated the, the intent, the letter of intent, right? I, I did hear that. And um, to, be, to be scolded because I had, I had asked somebody about the letter of intent, which I, I do believe it was in August when that was done. And you just validated what I had heard and what I believed when you said it wasn't in front of you. So I want to make that clear for the record. I appreciate you validating what I had thought I had heard. So that talks about two things, transparency and trust. So I thank you for that. Um, and that goes a long way because I remember Dick Cohen saying to me a long time ago, all you have is your word in the Senate, John, right? Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't bode this legislator well when somebody jumps at me and then all of a sudden I find out that the information that that individual gave me was not accurate. So thank you for validating that. Second thing is um, the academic, the, I mean, the University of Minnesota is an academic health institution, right? And it's really an, an important piece. And I guess maybe as, as the discussions are continuing on I me, mean, that's another question that maybe to ask Mr. Kassan, and um, uh, in, in not now, but maybe later on about, is it the intent then to continue that academic health priority that's there? And I know 2025 or 2026 is when that's, am I on, is that 2026 is when that's up for renew. And so um, that's always been, to the, to the governors who were here who had said it, especially talking about the, the, what brought Minnesota, you know, that spotlight was the academic health side of it. That's an important um, piece of our history. And so uh, thank you for, for clarifying some knowledge out there and understanding and then um, Thank you for, uh, for presenting the piece that you have. So I guess I don't know if it's more of a question. I think you validated two of the things, Madam Chair, but that this is an issue when you, got, when you own land um, on two of the buildings, and, and, I, um, uh, and, and, and plus the ambulatory and surgical, there's this there's piece about going to Mr. Meyer and Franz's point about, no, just give those assets back to the, to the University of Minnesota. And so uh, it's been a very good conversation. Thank you for having this. So, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if that was not so much a question. Yeah, I saw not. Okay. I just, I, All right. You. <laughs> uh, no, it's okay. Um, Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I've got some questions here. And I mean, we all uh, appreciate the asset that the university is um, to our state. It, you know, there's no doubt about that, but I've got some questions that are going to dig into some finances and such. So um, I, I, I ask these, uh, you know, not belittling the asset at all. But uh, the fact is, you know, we have uh, we've all seen and heard what's been going on in negotiations over the last number of months. And uh, in the last few days, uh, the exchange of the letter that uh, a possible sale. Um, or negotiated uh, agreement there but on these buildings. Um, but with that, at the same time, the university's got a billion dollar ask. So we're looking at acquiring those buildings, facilities, which are a valuable part of uh, what the university does uh, in its instruction for health care. But then we're going to be um, looking for the taxpayers to come forth with a billion dollars. Um, with that, uh, you know, I'm looking at this and kind of wondering uh, this offer from Sanford, uh, which happens to be one of uh, only two profitable um, hospitals in the state uh, in the last year. Balancing that, the offer from Sanford seems like a whole lot better for the Minnesota taxpayer and everything else involved because they've talked about what they would do to continue on with the, the medical schools, et cetera. Um, 
got any thoughts along those lines? Mr. France. Madam Chair, thank you, Senator. I think one of the things that the way we uh, try to, to look at this is that the, uh, the request that we've made to the legislature, the $950 million request uh, to acquire and begin operations of the facilities, is one of the ways that the university can make sure that in the future it continues to negotiate really good strategic partnerships with community uh, hospital systems going forward. One of, you know, one of the things that we see the Sanford and, and um, Fairview merger as, as an important opportunity for Fairview, we don't deny that from a business point of view. I mean, it clearly makes some sense. But on the other hand, we believe that restructuring, if you will, or uh, recreating the academic health system that's under the control of the university alongside of a reinvigorated Fairview with the Sanford merger is a great, is a, is a potentially great um, you know, um, agreement to make. So we've all along, and we've been telling uh, Mr. Gasson and Mr. Uh, Hereford quite regularly that we see a pathway forward for that kind of an arrangement, but it's pretty clear to us at the university that going forward uh, for the state's development of its ongoing health uh, mission for the state, we really need to maintain and operate and govern those flagship uh, facilities. So um, in the long run, it'll help us develop better agreements around the state, better treatment deliveries around the state if we have the uh, access, control, and governance of those facilities. And Dr. Or Dean Toller can tell you a little bit more about how that permeates into the state and the delivery of better treatment, but that's my initial response, Senator. Dr. Toller. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Senator, very important question. Uh, the first part that I really appreciate that you said is that there is a uh, alignment of the work with accountability. I, I really think you know, this is absolutely paramount, and it is our first obligation to Minnesota taxpayer and to you uh, that, that we are able to do that. I will affirm what uh, Senior Vice President Franz said, which is the ability to have authority over where we practice medicine, where is my operating room, where is my clinic and my clinical teams, is important because we will never you will never be at a whim of a healthcare system, any kind of healthcare system, or any kind of a, you know, other arrangement, because this is, you know, for all practical purposes, we are part of the state. We serve the state. We serve all the Minnesotans, and our mission-driven uh, actions differ from uh, organizations that are in the business of healthcare. We are in healthcare rather than just business of healthcare. How this? pertains to the greater Minnesota, I think is even more important. Because when we were asked by the legislature to do something about rural physicians, there will be about 1,800, maybe 2,800, it's difficult to know, gap by the end of this decade of the rural physicians in the state of Minnesota. If, and we, we immediately jumped on it. You know, that's where we have the rural programs where we train people in the rural greater Minnesota because the solution is very simple. The, the, the problem is complex, but simple. Because if you train them in rural Minnesota, they will stay in rural Minnesota. Simple as that. But nobody else is going to do that. You know, this is why we have a new medical campus that's going to open up in St. Cloud. This is why we had 50 years with your support, medical campus in Duluth. This is how we bring Native American physicians to the workforce and other um, traditionally underserved uh, groups of the society. This is how we, we deliver on the, 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 the promise of having uh, taxpayers as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a supporters, you know, and with you, with your leadership, really being able to be the, 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 the stewards of that incredible legacy and that incredible obligation that healthcare is in the state of Minnesota. So we are all after sustainable, more desirable future for your asset, which is University of Minnesota Medical School and its clinical arm. Madam Chair. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I thank you, and I think we uh, agree on a lot of those things, uh, particularly, uh, you know, we all realize the uh, shortcomings that we're facing in all facets of uh, health care. And uh, being somebody who lives up in the uh, 
northwest part of this state. Uh, we always talk about if we can train people in our part of the state, we can have a chance at keeping them. And so that is important as we spread this around. But so um, the one thing that I kind of go back to, and, and we, it, it's hard to, to do it while you're just sitting here, but the fact that 30 years ago this wasn't sustainable, this model, Today it's even tougher to do business and make this thing go. What do you foresee if this all works out as you as you would like it? You would acquire these additional buildings back, uh, be able to run the school as you see it. What type of money is that going to take a year? Is it something that can sustain itself, or are you going to be needing to come to the legislature and saying, you know, we're going to have to contribute X amount of dollars a year to make this go because it's an asset to Minnesota? Um, Dr. Toller. Madam Chair, Senator, again, excellent question. Let me ask the answer the first one first and then go to the second one. Uh, everything is different today than 30 years ago. 30 years ago, this was not the same medical school. We are much more clinical today. We have 1,700 faculty. These are specialists, subspecialists, primary care docs. These are some of the, the top level experts in the, in the state of Minnesota. We didn't have our faculty practice. The M physicians, the UMP that we mentioned, the clinical arm of them, we didn't have that. We have 20 plus different contracts with 20 different departments in the medical school, totally disorganized compared to what we have now. What we didn't have as well is we didn't have the five past years when we have shown to each other, to you I hope, and to our Fairview partners that we can do this because we created this clinical uh, structure, this joint clinical enterprise, where we co-lead everything. So the academic physician is at the helm with the Fairview executive, or what we call service line. And this, the, this matrix system is, is incredibly effective in delivering healthcare. So we have been in delivery of healthcare much more than we have ever been before. So my answer to your question, a simple one, is we are not looking at ongoing deficits. We are looking at, at, at breaking even. We are not looking at massive margins like you know, other places in the society. That's, that's, that's not what healthcare can do, actually, or should do in many ways. We are looking for being lean, clean, accountable, and really being led by academic physicians because that has been over and over proven to be the best for the patients and their communities. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you. Uh, and because that's kind of what we're looking, I was kind of looking for is what is ongoing in the obligations, and you're telling me that this global picture that you've got is sustainable, which is wonderful, and uh, um, we look forward to watching this whole thing progress. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Abler, and I will say we should probably get moving to the other testifiers that we have because we do have some stakeholders right, I, I, but here. But I think but it's a really good Senator, conversation. It is. Yeah. And I think this has opened my mind to some of the nuances I wasn't aware of. And, and so maybe I'll just uh, ask some kind of commenty questions, but I, I don't think you have time to answer them all the way. But it, um, so it, I think it's important to Minnesota that we require, reacquire these buildings. I think that's in, in true and with no particular disrespect to the Sanford organization. We just like them here. And so we don't know what the future holds. Um, and that's, I, I think, just kind of, so, and there's a value of that which will be discussed about the value of the, the bricks and mortar, and what that, you know, what, whatever, we already talked about that. Um, but Dr. Toller, um, it may well be that the functional operation of this is almost identical to what it is now uh, if you can come to terms with Fairview on an ongoing basis. I don't see Sanford importing a whole bunch of physicians into Minnesota to work there. I mean, maybe they are, but just, but just in terms of my grant, they're going to continue to work in the hinterlands and wherever they're working and do whatever great work they're going to do. Um, so if I, if I understand that right, and so it's... Um, it's not going to be a divorce where they move out and take all their stuff and you find somebody new to come in, like Alina or somebody else, but it seems like it's in your interest and Fairview's interest that you maintain a working relationship 
not so different than what you have now, except for now it would be the academic health person is in charge and the Fairview people are doing whatever they do. Um, and so can you say if I'm right about that? Then I just have probably one more comment. Um, Dr. Toller. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, you are absolutely right about that because, the, again, we, our quest is to become the statewide healthcare delivery system that ensures access to high-quality care for all Minnesotans. And I have to admit to a personal disappointment because it has been disappointing for me because my vision and for my physicians and for our medical school and for our clinical practice, we have seen these partnerships growing and getting better and better. It has been the decision by Fairview to step away from the model that we have built together over the last five years that prompted, that, that, that's why we are here to talk about how we will ensure that the high quality clinical structure that we have built together over the last five years can still uh, function and grow in the way that you described. And Madam Chair. Senator Abler. And I, I just am trying to bite my tongue to just be really brief, but I don't understand the stepping away part, which you can explain to me later. Um, and later I'll, I'll want to know what you need the 650 for, 650 million, if indeed this thing can continue forward sort of how it's been. And so that's, I don't know if you want to get into that. I think that's maybe for next week's bill that we can take that. Okay. If you can explain to us how the math works. Um, but I, uh, I I like the dialogue and I like the body language of the Mr. Herford and Mr. Gasson and, uh, as we're sitting here and, and, and your tone. Um, but I, th I think this has been a productive to move the move down the road, but I think there's one thing that has to happen on behalf of the, um, the merger suitors um, is that they really need to slow down. Uh, if indeed you're going to come up with a working rapport that's going to serve your, if you merge or not, that's, for frankly, that's the less of my interest. My interest is in this part, and then an ongoing workable thing that serves well, and you want that as well. And so if it's too fast and people feel too aggrieved and too, you can see the edge of that here. Um, it's going to be harder to work out the kind of deal you want. It's going to cost us more money per Senator Utke, and it's not going to be as good. So uh, I think this is a, a really good dialogue, and I'm just honored to be a part of it. And Madam Chair, I think this has been a really good uh, well spent of two hours. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, did you have a response? No. Oh, okay. I think we'll, we'll leave it there. I, I appreciate your both being here and, and sharing your um, remarks and the information that you left with us. And I'm sure if we have more questions, we will reach out. So thank, thank you, you again. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now I'd like to move on. We have some individuals um, who would uh, like to testify. And if we could have um, three come up at a time, that would be helpful. I have Brad Leto. Cliff Adams and Dana Seifert. And thank you for coming tonight and being willing to, to share your thoughts with us. And uh, Mr. Leto, please go certainly. ahead. <coughs> Excuse me, Th certainly. Uh, good evening, Chair Wickland and Health and Human Service Committee members. Uh, my name is Brad Letta, and I'm a secretary treasurer of the Minnesota AFL-CIO, collective voice of Minnesota's unions. And I, I certainly won't attempt to be as eloquent as the former governor, as the attorney general, and uh, Dr. Toller and Mr. Friends. It would be impossible, I think, for me to, to do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm here because uh, uh, bringing in a for-profit corporation from a state, quite honestly, with few reg regulations to run one of Minnesota's largest health, per health providers is bad for countless people who depend on care from Fairview hospitals and clinics. I'm here because we don't want an out-of-state corporation like Sanford trying to squeeze profits from the University of Minnesota's law school, or Minnesota's medical school, I'm sorry. And I'm here because Minnesota's labor movement stands in opposition to a major to a merger that's bad for working people, both inside and outside of the Fairview system. Our state government has an obligation to pursue lower health care costs, as was mentioned by numerous people here, better outcomes for patients, and better conditions for health care workers. The merger will do the exact opposite. As health care has become more consolidated year after year, the only people benefiting are the CEOs. 
Now Minnesota's regulators have a chance to draw a line in the sand and tell these CEOs enough is enough. Especially when I hear comments from them like always talking about negotiating a value. So I guess my question is, is what are the value of workers and communities? What is their value? So you and us and all of us have a chance to tell for-profit health care that Minnesotans are not going to stand by idly while an out-of-state corporation tries to squeeze profits from workers and patients. I will close by a, a, actually a t-shirt of a, one of the nurses that I saw out there that says that save one life, you are a hero. Save hundreds of lives, you are a nurse. We are committed to stopping this merger. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Cliff Adams. Good evening, Madam Chair and other committee Adam. My name is Cliff Adams. Uh, I am an NST and a grievance leader in the SEIU. Current CEOs James Hereford and Bill Gasson are claiming this merger will bring many positives and benefit the health care of millions. Yet there is no clear evidence that consolidation improves quality of care. In fact, multiple mergers throughout the U.S. have shown the opposite effects. There is less access to services, increased insurance costs, and patients are paying more for the same level or worse off care. One recent example in Tennessee, where two hospital systems merged to become Ballot Health in 2018, proved these points. Serving nearly 1.2 million people, a merger opposed by the FTC was still given the go-ahead by the state attorney general and the DOH. And guess what happened next? Services were consolidated and patient fees were increased. I've seen pleading voices fall on deaf ears when requesting better training. I've had leadership in Fairview directly tell me we are not interested in safe staffing. I've seen a lack of accountability and responsibility when it comes to addressing racial equity and equality in the workplace. What do these things matter? In the last four years, I've seen our healthcare system strip away the caring aspect and monetize the health aspect. In the last four years, I've seen failure from my employer. We are struggling to tackle these major issues with a large Minnesota-based and oriented organization. And now we wish to combine with an out-of-state and equally disgruntled organization that does not hold Minnesotans first. Very simply put, two wrongs do not make a right. We need Attorney General Keith Ellison and other branches of the government to help us deal with the problems in our own backyard first and foremost. We want the leaders and boards currently in place to be held responsible so that the people who show up day in and day out, physicians, nurses, CNAs, nutrition services, ES, and all other staff can have what's needed to foster a positive and effective caring environment for our patients. This merger will not serve the people. It will take away the power of choice from so many Minnesotans and increase financial burden. I stand with MNA and other unions presenting in opposing the merger between Fairview and Sanford Health. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Seifert? Good evening, Chair Wickland and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to address this body. My name is Dana Seifert. I'm a member of the Minnesota Farmers Union, as is my husband, Mike Seifert, who was recently appointed to be president of the chapter in Scott County, where we live and are moving into management of his family's fourth generation, Century Farm. My off-farm job is as a physical therapist. I earned my doctorate from the University of Minnesota, and I'm also a board-certified pediatric clinical specialist. I want to lift up the concerns of two overlapping groups who would be affected by this proposed merger, the patients and the providers. For the past 10 years, I've worked in rural areas of Scott and Nicollet counties in the public school system, then the current largest healthcare system in the state, and finally, a small woman-owned private practice that was created to fill the gaps and meet the needs of children and their families that those other systems are leaving behind. Our state needs more providers, especially in rural communities. You have a unique opportunity to ensure that more families don't have to drive for hours to connect with the services they and their children need to grow and thrive. Healthcare mergers are never proposed by the patients, but by people with business degrees in the pursuit of improved revenue flows for healthcare systems. 
the most common report I heard from patients while working in a system that went from being managed locally by a group of Benedictines to a billion dollar revenue healthcare corporation was that instead of getting an appointment with their primary care provider who knew them and their children by name in two to three days, they now had to wait weeks. That same system is currently struggling to maintain safe nurse to patient ratios and its physicians are not given enough time to adequately educate their patients on their conditions or provide satisfactory aftercare following major medical events. The overscheduling of providers to increase billable units contributes to the moral injury and burnout of providers that were magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic and its fallout. During the initial days of the pandemic following the governor's first stay at home order, the large system I worked for at the time took over three weeks to get organized and be able to provide limited telehealth services to our patients. The small private practice where I work now during that same period had telehealth going for every patient within two and a half days. That's the difference between needing to change course rapidly while in a trim little sailboat versus the Titanic. Bigger is not always better. When it comes to navigating the uncertain waters of our future and the unpredictable challenges to our systems, the people of Minnesota will be better served by a larger fleet of right-sized groups, not a dwindling number of lumbering behemoths with too many layers of management between the people making decisions up in the C-suites and the providers on the front lines serving patients. I urge the Attorney General's office and this body to use every anti-monopoly tool at your disposal to protect the best interests of Minnesotans by blocking this merger. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, do you have any questions for these testifiers? Okay. I don't see any. Thank you very much. And next. Um, Next, I would like to call forward Colin Whitmore and Emily Wright. Uh, welcome to the committee, and please um, introduce yourself and provide your testimony. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Colin Whitmore. I am a first year medical student at the University of Minnesota, and I'm here to represent student voices in opposition to the Sanford Fairview merger. Since the joint commerce and health hearing was held in the House, the university has announced its plans to buy back its Twin Cities facilities. This plan would help address some of the student concerns about preserving our research rankings and academic standing. However, the plan still does not compensate for the health equity and access problems posed by the potential merger. Regardless of the university's efforts to disentangle itself, we continue to fully oppose the Sanford Fairview merger. As future physicians, roughly 70% of whom will continue to practice in Minnesota for the remainder of our careers, it is critically important that we fight for a Minnesotan healthcare system that operates on behalf of its patients and workers, not profits. We have deep concerns about the impacts of this merger on rural Minnesotans. Corporate mergers have historically demonstrated an eager willingness to underfund and consolidate rural hospitals. By supporting this merger, we'd be in direct opposition to our mission to provide excellent care to Minnesotans regardless of their geographical location. Despite Sanford's claim to focus on rural health care, we seriously question at what cost they do so. Since this merger was proposed, we have heard multiple testimonies from former employees of the Sanford system complaining of the corporation's poor labor conditions, including a nurse who left the Sanford system after falling asleep at the wheel driving home at night due to working long hours at a severely understaffed rural facility. Not only were these conditions unsafe, but she was not being properly compensated for her work and dedication. The Sanford Fairview merger is not unique, but simply representative of a wider trend of aggressive expansion by corporate health systems within and across state lines. At best, massive healthcare system mergers have no clear benefit for its workers, patients, or communities. At worst, they are anti-competitive and verge on violations of antitrust seemingly intent on taking over health systems across the Midwest and labeling them mergers. Sanford's track record of attempted mergers of the last decade, including a failed merger with Fairview in 2013, speak to its interest in growth for the sake of growth, not its reported interest in increasing patient access or the optimization of healthcare. Studies show that cross-market mergers result in higher prices for patients and increased rates of burnout in their workers, and these are already significant issues in healthcare. 
In conclusion, University of Minnesota students do not support increasing costs for patients, do not support limiting rural patient access, do not support the continued corporatization of healthcare, and we do not support this, the Sanford Fairview merger. I took an oath to protect patients, which I'm sure is similar to an oath you took when you took on the responsibility of representing Minnesota and its people. Other state legislatures have acted to stop massive mergers before, and that's what the medical students of the University of Minnesota, the future doctors in our communities, are asking the legislatures to ultimately do. Madam Chair and Committee, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Wright? Hi, yes. Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, first and foremost, thank you. It's so late. It's so late. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Emily Wright, and I actually work as a bedside nurse at M Health Fairview Southdale Hospital in Edina, Minnesota. Um, I've worked there in different nursing jobs for almost 10 years. My family and I receive our care within the M Health Fairview network, and I've devoted my career to making this the best place for anyone to get their care. Through staffing shortages, previous mergers, contract bargainings, ER nursing through the pandemic, being verbally and physically assaulted by a patient, walking the strike line, and caring for some of the most horrifically mangled and broken humans physically and mentally, I have shown back up to work again and again to be there and use my skills to help the patients that need me, that need us as healthcare professionals. Um, Watching Fairview Corporate and Sanford try to push this merger through as quickly as possible with what seems to be little to no regard to the repercussions it will have on our community and our staff feels like the nail in the coffin for Minnesota health care right now. I already personally know several nurses who have completed applications and are actively trying to move out of Fairview to hopefully pull themselves beyond Sanford's reach, most of them because they have worked for Sanford in the past and are stalwart that they never will again. In a time when current studies show that over half of active bedside nurses are considering options to leave working at the bedside and in the hospital, we know that massive corporate restructuring increases burnout and decreases job satisfaction in nurses and in doctors. Minnesota simply cannot afford to hemorrhage any more healthcare workers, exacerbating our healthcare staffing crisis further at this time. Healthcare conglomerates, which let's be frank, um, is what this is going to be are proven to end in higher cost of health care for consumers. And in the interest of time and candor, consumers, we are talking about humans. Your neighbors, your family, yourselves, the underemployed, the underhoused, the disabled, BIPOC, LGBTQ+, vulnerable adults, everyone. This is outlined through research compiled as mergers have exploded in popularity throughout the United States and have been handily rejected, paused, and probated to reduce anti-competitive behavior. Furthermore, there has been substantial evidence that bringing in larger, massively funded private organizations has actually shown a decline in patient satisfaction with their care. And specific to Sanford, um, their bowling over approach to dismantling community-based care has been rejected in the markets surrounding Minnesota over and over again since 2018, having been referred to on record as aggressive and volatile. I'm strongly urging you to refer to the researched white paper submitted by the Minnesota Nurses Association to you and make a decision to block this merger in order to keep Minnesota health care on the map as some of the best care that we can receive in the United States. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you truly for your time and for your devotion to your constituents. We really need you on this. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, whether it's members around the table or uh, testifiers, we're all entitled to our opinion. But I've heard some data here that I just want to uh, respond to, and that was the fact that uh, um, Sanford would be limiting rural health care access. I happen to live in the rural area, and I've watched them do nothing but expand it, whether it's rural Minnesota, rural North Dakota, or rural South Dakota. Um, I just want to clarify that because I don't believe that to be a true statement. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, you're here to say what you like, and uh, I appreciate that. But uh, I didn't feel that that was a fair statement. So thank you. Any other member questions for these testifiers? Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate your 
um, your hard work and daily work in the healthcare fields, and I appreciate your interest in becoming a healthcare provider and, and how you intend to serve Minnesotans. And um, so, thank you for for coming tonight and sharing your views. And now, I'd just like to call up the last two testifiers. We have Emma Franz and Mary Turner. And Mary Turner. Welcome to the committee, and um, please, Ms. Franz, um, give your name and um, begin your testimony. Thanks. Um, well, thank you for having me. My name is Emma Franz, um, Madam Chairwoman and um, elected representatives. I'm here to uh, present my position as a nurse, a Fairview employee, and um, a family member of a um, cardiac patient who needs a heart transplant at the U of M. So this is deeply important to me on a personal level. Um, I don't understand why a South Dakota company would come in and take over the um, university hospital. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. The U of M is a land-grant institution, and its mission is to represent and um, educate and care for communities in Minnesota. I don't see how Sanford Health, based out of South Dakota, would have that same imperative. Um, also, regarding um, studies that were uh, that Madam Chairperson brought up that were refuted um, by uh, the representative from Sanford, these studies, I believe that you were citing, are highly reputable studies. Um, they are studies uh, that were published by the Federal Trade Commission, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And these um, studies, I believe, were conducted kind of in more metropolitan um, or kind of dense areas. But that is exactly what we're talking about here. Fairview has a, a lot of like hospital clinics in the metropolitan area. Sanford is more outstate. So when we're talking about um, the effects of raising healthcare costs, these studies are completely applicable to this situation. So I'm concerned that um, there will be a, a monopoly, frankly. And anytime there's a monopoly, it um, brings into question the ability for there to be competitive pricing. Also, um, when Fairview took over Health East last year, they closed two hospitals, like with in pretty short order also. Uh, people lost their jobs. Um, so please take my comments into consideration. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Turner? Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Mary Turner. I'm president of the Minnesota Nurses Association, and we represent 22,000 plus nurses across Minnesota, um, Iowa and Wisconsin and North Dakota. I am also, but more importantly tonight, I am here as a bedside care nurse, as an intensive care nurse. And I've heard a lot of, um, tonight we've heard a lot of promises and we've heard a lot of statistics, but I and the nurses that are here in this room and all 22,000 of us, you know what we're concerned about? We're concerned about our nurse patient relationship in our communities. There's nothing more basic to healthcare than that nurse patient relationship. We are, the, we are the team that are there 24-7, 365 days a year. And we, the thing about it is I have traveled this whole state from one end to another this past decade. And I've been to more than my share of city councils, usually because I've been alerted by the nurses in the community. One such city council was because they were thinking of selling their community hospital to a larger healthcare corporation. I begged them not to do that because I said, if you do that, your, um, your, your services will dwindle and your prices will go up. Only to come back several years later after it went through 
that that's exactly what happened, that their services got sent to a bigger city. Another one that the nurses alerted to, that a hospital down in southern, southeastern Minnesota was about to downsize and basically almost close because they were going to move all the services to a bigger town, eight, well, I think 20 miles up the road. The problem here is down there in southern Minnesota, you know, seven times a year you close off the freeway. And, and so that town that now loses the services of, of labor and delivery and emergency care and all this other kind of stuff, they're trapped like rats when, the, when a good snowstorm comes through because they literally close off 94. What we're concerned about and what I'm concerned about, and the nurses of Minnesota are concerned about, is that our health care, just like our docs at the U, God love them, it needs to stay in the community. We need to find a way within Minnesota to serve the people here in Minnesota. And we need to serve them at where they live because it doesn't do any good for my little friend Dorothy who lives in Sandstone. When she needs to have something done, it doesn't do her any good to have to say, well, Dorothy, why don't you pack up and come to the city for your appointment? My friend Dorothy in Sandstone can't sit in the car that long to go all the way to the city for her doctor appointment. These are the kind of things that matter to the nurses, these individual interactions between our patients and ourselves. This is what matters. This is what matters to the people of Minnesota is those little, those huge inconveniences that start to play, take place when they have to go farther and farther and farther away from their homes and their neighborhoods and the people and the nurses and the doctors and the caregivers and no matter what level that they grew up with. Every time we make them go farther and farther, having to go to Duluth, having to go to Fargo, having to go to the cities and every other little community in between is, is, is left closing, so, seeing so many clinics and so many hospitals close in this pursuit of consolidation so that ultimately someday, what are we gonna have six different cities across Minnesota and that's where everyone has to go to for their health care? Well, I'll tell you what, the good life, the, the American dream of rural, rural America, that's not so much a dream. Not when you're in a town that in the middle of the winter, your freeway gets closed off and you're trapped. And that's just one example. So we stand in total opposition to any further consolidations of, of, of health care because it's gone too far as it is and it's getting away from our real purpose, our purpose as nurses. And that is to care for our patients because that is our bottom line and we will do anything to protect that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, both of you. Uh, members, any questions for these testifiers? I don't see any, but I do appreciate, I really appreciate you both coming tonight and um, sharing with us um, this important information. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, members, and um, we will, um, I, I've kind of given some leniency. The Senate is different from the other body. We, we don't, um, we have, expect quiet in our chambers while we're having a hearing. So, but I do appreciate that you are supportive of, of the people who provided testimony tonight. Um, members, I don't know if you have any final comments or questions, um, any more discussion? Uh, Senator Ebler? Oh, oh actually, I'm sorry. Let me... Senator Kupek. Yields to the crew. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, everybody tonight who came out and testified. I have a very unique perspective, I think, of anybody that is up on this uh, panel here. I think I'm the only one that gets my health care currently from Sanford, uh, living in Fargo, Moorhead. Um, and I was there when Sanford did do the merge with Merit Care. And I remember that very well. And I, I have 
it's a it's a big employer in town, and Fargo has really become it has become a medical destination. Um, and I will say there were uh, you know a lot of people that were very nervous when that happened. Uh, it was at that time a South Dakota company taking over a North Dakota company. Um, they have made a tremendous investment in our community, and I did talk. I have quite a few friends uh, who work at Sanford, and I did talk with them this weekend, people who were there when that merger happened. And they, they did say, you know, at the beginning, we were, we were very nervous, but the overall trend uh, they thought had been a positive for the community, that the merger went, went very well. So, um, I, and in the, the fact is, whenever organizations merge, it is a scary proposition. I've worked at places that have merged, and it is a very scary pop, uh, proposition. I will say the one thing, and this is uh, my advice, um, this has come very fast. And I think a lot of people, uh, when everything moves fast, there is a lot of concerns, and rightfully so. And I think, uh, Madam Chair, when you get buy-in and you talk to those groups um, at the beginning, I think when you can get buy-in from groups like the nurses uh, and doctors, in the Fairview system, I think when you have those conversations and you can get that buy-in, you end up with a better result, and you get a, you could probably get a lot less nervousness about mergers. And and I'm and I'm going to take the whole University of Minnesota component out because that's to me a, a, a lot different. I will say the the one thing, uh, obviously, coming into the Twin Cities metropolitan area is a much different healthcare market than the Fargo Moorhead area. I am reminded constantly all the time uh, by my constituents and by my colleagues that I do not live in the Twin Cities and I live in a different place. And so I would I would just offer also that advice to you uh, and and you know concerns about a lot of the nurses union and of SEIU, the healthcare workers here, um, which are, you know, they do look out for their patients, they look out for the hospitals, and I think more ways you can find to talk to them together uh, and come together. And as we like to say in the Senate, to find the, the peace in the valley, those things and come together, I think the better off everybody on all sides uh, will be. So that's just kind of my takeaway and perspective. Thank you, Senator Kupak. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I, I think this has been a, a tremendous opportunity to learn a lot, to hear a lot of voices. Um, I've, I won't repeat anything I said, um, but just going forward, I think Senator Kupek, uh, just to reiterate the thing about slow her down a little bit, uh, and to the Sanford Fairview crew and your array of suits over there uh, who are probably taking notes, I suggest that you listen well to the voices you heard tonight. Because uh, the voices of the nurses and the SEIU workers, to me, do represent the front line of people. And they made some interesting assertions that are, I mean, it, I mean they made some important assertions that I think would be well to be noted by you all. When the hearing comes up, Madam Chair, I'd like to have some kind of opportunity for whoever the details of that to be addressed. Um, because, and, and there's plenty of challenges in the nursing array. I mean, anyway, we're talking about some tomorrow, but um, I, I would suggest you go back and listen to the comments and see where did they miss I mean, where are you missing the boat if there's that? And how do you plan to be, if you, this goes forward, how do you plan to be the kind of, you know, healthcare system that we want to be so proud of? And um, I think that's the comments. And I, I think I kind of screwed up how I get somebody that smoothly. But I um, don't, don't neglect what they said. Um, and, uh, I, but Madam Chair, I think this has been as useful a hearing as you could possibly have assembled. Thank you. Thank you. Other members, comments? Any comments? Um, seeing none, I um, just for myself, as, but this has been very informative. I've, I've learned a lot about all the, the different aspects, um, not only the, the business aspects and the, and the reasons for um, the, the corporations or the organizations that wish to bring the transaction forward and, and move it along. I, um, also, the university, thank you for presenting your um, what you can contribute and, and the vision you have for your, your future. Um, and also, lastly, uh, thank you for all of the testifiers and, and those of you who have attended who care so much about how uh, Minnesotans are receiving their health care in Minnesota and being able to access it. I think we have a lot to consider in the legislature. Um, we have 
as I mentioned earlier, we have a kind of a fixed timeline for doing our work, but we um, need to have uh, the ability to you know, critically assess and determine, you know, what's the best um, way for us to to make contributions either in decisions about funding or legislation that can help us um, really analyze whether this is the uh, a transaction that is in the best interests of Minnesotans and, um, you know, how we can uh, make sure that going forward we're making the right decisions for our state. So, again, I appreciate all of your time and um, coming tonight and seeing no other business before us. We are adjourned.